Welcome, everybody, uh, to the first episode of Real Squawk, Bird Keeping Conversations. Um, I'm going to start the introductions with uh, Lisa. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Lisa Bolstad. Um, I live in Parker, Colorado, and I help run a parrot welfare organization here. Uh, we deal mostly with education and uh, rehoming. And my best friend, Cherise Mix, and I actually started this organization because we'd been through three other rescue organizations and they all didn't either didn't align with our values um, or they didn't stay together. So we kind of took a look at things and decided to do things a little differently. And uh, that included working not only with other rescues, but with breeders and uh, really just anybody in the bird community. Awesome. Uh, my name is Jason Crean. I am in Orlando, Florida. Um, I have been breeding uh, Arasaris for 25 years now, among other things, uh, parrots as well. And um, I'm currently a biologist that teaches courses in animal nutrition and zoo biology. Uh, Jordan? Hi guys, uh, my name is Jordan Daniel and I um, live in the Dallas, Texas area. I work with um, about 16 different species of lorries right now um, and uh, a couple of rose-breasted cockatoo pairs. I'd like to ultimately expand into the cockatoos as well, uh, but I started with lorries almost 10 years ago now. So I've just been slowly building up uh, my collection. A lot of species are very hard to find right now. And this isn't just pertaining to lorries, but just in aviculture as a whole, um, a lot of species are disappearing. So um, that's kind of a little bit about me, so. And I'm Tiffany. <laughs> I'm Tiffany Park. I uh, live in Gainesville, Florida, and I currently breed the parrotlets um, red fronts of peccaritis, and then I also have Sierra parakeets. I started in about 2007. I was breeding building infants almost exclusively, and then for a period of time, I bred some other wax bills, so like um, blue cap cordon blues, fire finches, and um, I worked almost exclusively with finches until about 2014 when I branched into working with parrotlets. Um, So we all have different experiences, come from different aspects, different facets of aviculture, uh, but we all have the same mission. And our mission is to bring our experience and the experience of others to everyone that wants to listen. Um, so we know that there's no shortcuts. We've all seen um, the mistakes that others have made. Um, and we want to give everybody the very best information that we can. So we thought the perfect first episode topic would be myth busting. Um, we hear a lot of information parroted by others, rumors and anecdotes that they've heard. And so we're going to try and tackle some of those today. Um, the first one is caging, um, you know, keeping uh, things in habitats. But basically, there's three major things that we think about when we think about aviculture. It's husbandry, which is what most of us are involved in. Um, you can hear my palm is thinks he's he's uh he thinks I'm talking to him right now. Can you hear him? Sorry, <laughs> a little a little bit. <laughs> um, matchmaking, which is you know how we set up pairs and and uh, why we put certain um, individual birds together, and then demography, looking at populations and how we can keep these um, keep these species going. So we thought. A good place to start today would be uh, some of those husbandry topics where there's lots of myths out there. Um, one is that all birds need something to sleep in. Now, I know we all have our opinions on these, um, so I'll let whoever wants to start first um, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I don't know. Does I, I feel like Lisa needs to start off with this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need to start off. Okay. <laughs> Well, because, because I'm more of the pet person in the group, um, mm -hmm. 
Definitely, there are species that you never want to have near fleece, for sure. Cockatiels and lorries being among those. 100%, they're going to eat the fleece and they're going to end up at the vet's office. Um, I use a happy hut for one of my birds, uh, Hans Macaw. She's never picked at it. She's never messed with it. She doesn't go in it except at night. And uh, I have a Quaker who uses a... It's got fleece on top, but it's got a perch underneath it that she sleeps with. Uh, other than that, I haven't used them either because they end up ripping them apart and I'm afraid they're eating them or because they're going to go in there and they're going to get hormonal, which in a pet home is something that you don't want. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll kind of, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think one of the biggest things that I ran into when I was breeding the finches was that individuals who had finches just for the pleasure of having them had this misconception that they needed to have a nest to sleep in at night. And then then I would get messages, oh, no, now they're laying eggs and they won't stop. And um, you know, I think when you're talking about owning a colony of finches, if you're just having them from an ornamental perspective, they don't need to have something to sleep in to be happy and functional and healthy. Right. And I'll kind of piggyback off that too, um, when it comes to the hormonal thing. So a lot of people, you know, bring home a new bird and it's a baby and it's not yet mature. And they don't realize that once hormones start kicking in and once that bird is mature, that, that can possibly trigger, um, you know, birds to start laying eggs. Next thing you know, you have a chronic egg layer or a, a nippy bird that is constantly biting you or screaming. And, you know, really, I look at it this way. There's no happy huts in nature. You know, they're going to sleep in a tree. They're going to sleep in a hollow. That's kind of what I like to go off of. And I like to tell people, you know, um, granted, everybody's going to do what they want to do. But ultimately, you do have birds that are going to chew them up. You do have birds that are going to develop behavioral issues because of these things. Yeah, and birds sleeping in hollows in the wild is when they're nesting. But typically they're not in, they don't nest, they don't go inside of anything unless they're foraging or, or whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. So these are just a bad idea. We've heard hormones, we've heard eating the fleece, um, but also uh, foot health, foot, leg, and posture health. Um, birds have evolved for a long, long time to lock their feet in place, and that's why they sleep on a perch. And that is the healthiest for them. This is a product of anthropomorphism, which I know grates on all of us because we see it all too often. Um, but that's assigning human attributes to animals, which puts them at a disadvantage. Um, you can totally treat your bird like a member of the family, but you can't treat them like a human member of the family, right? Human, they're not human and you're not giving right. the bird enough credit. So, um, right. You know, giving them a cushy place to sleep is not beneficial for so many reasons, Every, you know, all of the reasons that were discussed. Right, right. Not to mention, you know, all of the horror stories I've heard um, about birds getting hung up in these things. Mm -hmm. You know, they entangle themselves, something happens, you know, you go away for an hour or two, you come back home, and you see the bird has hung itself or something, yep. you know. So they're, they're more, they're definitely a marketing gimmick, um, you know, and you have companies that want to, want to advertise these things and sell these things. And really they don't, they don't put a disclosure, you know, on the packaging or anything like that, or even on the label, you know, your bird might hang itself, you know? So yeah, a lot of these people don't really, a lot of pet homes specifically don't, are not aware of that, you know? Yeah, it's, it's a sticky situation no matter how you, how you look at it. I would say the only maybe two caveats to that would be Quakers and Patagonian Conyers. I mean, not necessarily in a fleece tent. I know that my Patagonians all sleep on the bottom of their cages. I usually put mm -hmm. just something cardboard down there for them to go in. And that's probably because in the wild they live in dugout tunnels in the side of cliffs. And Quakers... You know, they live in those big community nests, so they kind of seem to want to be in something 
a little tighter. Again, doesn't necessarily have to be fleece, but I've noticed they'll get under something either, even if it's just a, a perch above them to have resting on their back. So. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. And it, usually in the spring, especially when I get uh, people contacting me about their hormonal birds, um, I usually, this is the first question I ask, is there something they can sleep in? Sometimes it's a cardboard box that they thought was cute to put in there. Um, anything that they can climb into, you may think it's cute, but it, you know, <laughs> you really need to second guess that. Um, right. Because it will lead to things and you can deny it all you want, but um, we've seen it over and over and over again. Right. So this also goes to perching. Um, and I know Tiffany and I have talked about the dreaded dowel, <laughs> the dowel perch that comes with so many, uh, uh, so many cages, but, um, what problems have you seen, um, among all of you that, um, you know, can, can be solved with simple natural perching? Um, I mean, well, I can, oh, geez, I'm always trying to <laughs> happens on You're Zoom good. all the time. You're good. <laughs> Go ahead. I was talking about this with Jason before we jumped on, but I think the, the number one time that I see this is um, the number of people who ask questions in these kakariki groups about how to keep their, their birds' nails um, from not being overgrown. And I think most of the time what you see in those pages are they're in these situations where they can perch and their, their whole foot can wrap around it. Um, I have, you know, the big, I have a big outdoor aviary that most of my birds live in unless they're inside breeding. And um, there's not a perch in there that's not more than probably about an inch and a half to two inches in diameter. Some of them are bigger. So they can never fully get their foot around it. And I don't have any problems with nail health or, um, you know, overgrown nails. I don't have to clip their toenails. Um and so what I did when I when I bring them inside, I made sure that the perches that are in the cages that they're in inside when they're breeding are similar. And it, I mean, that's one thing that I've seen just in my own experience that, yeah, if you have them on these dowels or if you have them on these kind of twiggy branches, they, they don't have the natural opportunity to wear that toenail down. And so it does, you know, come into play that you have to do something to keep the nail length down. And then... Inevitably that, you know, what could happen is you could clip their toenail too short and then you're dealing with bleeding. Um, if you're breeding, the biggest thing with the Kakarikis is that with their toenails, if they're super long, they tend to regularly kind of puncture their eggs. So then you have, you know, mortality issues in the nest with your eggs and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to offer um, various sizes, various size perches in, in each flight that I have, um, you know, when we're referencing wild bird or talking about wild birds and what they do there, they don't have one specific size, you know, they, they're all over everything. They're climbing up and down, you know, um, I do, however, have at least two really thick perches in each flight just so they can't completely wrap their toes around, um, as Tiffany mentioned. Um, so I, I've acquired a lot of lorries, um, especially that have had severe uh, nail issues. And it was because of lack of proper perching, um, the dowel perches, um, even the, you know, the sandpaper type perches, you know, that they don't, they don't really work. Um, they're actually doing damage to the bottom of the bird's foot, you know, more than they are doing good. So I've definitely seen a lot of issues with that. Yeah. And I tell people often like birds aren't looking for the right diameter branch to land on in the wild, right? <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're landing wherever they're landing. And I right. love the picture of these cockatiels and this finch because you can see they're sitting on the perch, but not around mm -hmm. the perch. And I tried mm -hmm. to get those natural branches, um, you know, in, in, my, in my big free flight aviary where I have doves and uh, fruit doves and, um, you know, small tanagers and things like that. Um, it's all planted. So they, they land on whatever they land on. And um, mm -hmm. let me tell you, they exploit every inch of that aviary. <laughs> they're all over the place. So yeah, I know that yeah. they're getting, and someone just asked me like, how do you catch all these birds to groom them? I don't, I don't have to do that. <laughs> they do it themselves. Yeah. Nature does it. yeah. Well, I've even, I've even, 
I've even seen um, a couple people post um, or, you know, post to Facebook that they're looking for um, an avian vet to take their bird to and their nails and their beaks are not overgrown at all, but they mm -hmm. think it's a necessity when it's not. Honestly, mm -hmm. you just give stuff, you know, to your bird to shred up, to chew on, uh, climb on, and you're good to go. It's not, it's not something you have to pay for monthly and it should never be that, you know? Mm -hmm. right. Well, and I think a lot of them might not realize that if you have a bird with severe overgrowth of the beak, it's probably something else that's underlying in their condition of causing oh, yeah. a liver issue or something like that. Yeah, especially right. especially with beaks, you shouldn't have mm -hmm. you shouldn't have a big issue with that. Right. Some of them even do their own toenails. One of my Patagonians, you can watch him <laughs> snipping them off. He puts them in his mouth, snips. Snip, snip. I do that too. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> You're a Patagonian, Jason. Who yeah, knew? It's a, it, it's, uh, yeah, let's go with that. Not that I'm neurotic. <laughs> do you sleep in a Guinness box? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Irish. I'm not answering that question. <laughs> Um, so obviously, um, all of us have dealt with the myths around nutrition. Um, and I know that all of us have been on social media trying to teach people the right way to feed birds. Um, and a, a lot of people will say, well, there's more than white, one right way. And I'm, I'm, I mean, a generalized right way uh, to feed birds. Um, a couple of the myths, since nutrition is is something that I focus, I tend to focus on a lot. Um, the top, the two top pictures I'm hearing a lot are bad foods for birds. Now, if you feed only that left picture, that sunflower seed picture, yes, you're going to have a really unhealthy bird. If you only feed um, papaya, you're going to have a, an unhealthy bird, right? So, diversifying the diet is important. The, you know, sunflower seeds got a bad rep because they were the only thing or at least the primary thing. Um, and I know in the 1980s, when I first started breeding cockatiels, like that was the main part of the diet because that's all that was available. Um, and that's all that we knew. Um, I didn't have the internet to look up that, hey, people are feeding them greens. Go figure. Like this, <laughs> that was an exciting thing. Um, I'm totally mm -hmm. dating myself here. But with, uh, <laughs> With, with the sunflowers, like sunflower seeds are extremely nutritious, but a few a day go a long way and you don't need, you know, to make those the predominant part of the diet. Um, same thing with fruit. You know, we, we've been hearing a lot lately that, you know, the sugar in fruit is bad and, and all that sort of thing. And um, I know I had just posted to my um, avian raw whole food nutrition group on Facebook Um that there's ways around that. Feeding unripe fruit, for example, is really beneficial, um, not just because it's lower in sugar, but it's higher in starch and prebi prebiotic fiber, which, you know, helps fuel the gut uh, bacteria that we want to keep healthy. So, um, you know, we, we, hear, we hear about these myths all the time. And uh, it's often like, oh, I was told or I heard Mm -hmm. Or my vet said, but that's often almost entirely anecdotal. Um, it's not based on any kind of education. Um, same thing with the stuff at the bottom here. You know, bird bread, um, cooked pasta and rice, like those are not desirable foods. We think we thought that was healthy for a long time, uh, but it's not. So those two bottom pictures, definitely not things that you want to do. Things that you heat typically result in a lot of inflammatory compounds. And those are things that could lead to long-term disease. So those are some myths I hear all the time in the nutrition world. I'm sure you all have things to add. Well, I'm talking on top of the sunflower thing, just the, the fear of fat in general. So the fear <laughs> of covering things like tree nuts and, you know, those healthy sources of fat, but then, you know, they're worried about offering a healthy source of fat, but then you see them feeding them like bacon mm -hmm. or pizza or french fries. Yeah, it's yeah. funny how many people will be absolutely out of their minds on fruit, but pizza and french fries are, mm -hmm. are fine. 
Well, this goes back to, you know, what Jason said in the beginning. We have to remember that they're birds and not people. And even these, you know, even bacon, you know, uh, a lot of bacon, pizza, just junk food that's not good for people, for humans. What makes you think it's healthy for a bird? You know, they're not human. That they, No, they don't need to sit at the table with you and have and eat your dinner and share your dinner <laughs> with you. You know, they just... It that's a little far fetched in my opinion, and um, yeah, it's 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 not good. So, well, and, and I hear that whole thing about well, it's just a treat, right? Mm -hmm. But when you think about how little a bird is, right? How much a bird weighs, even a macaw, right? Compared to your body weight and what you eat, and how much impact a little tiny bit of really bad food can have on that bird in the short term and the long term. Like, those are things we just don't consider a lot of the time. And so, um, you know, when people people have been told to feed people food to to their birds, but it's got to be healthy people food, right? Not, right. Like, not steak. You know, animal, <laughs> animal meat in general should not be fed to birds. Um, mm -hmm. What do we see in the wild? We see birds eating bugs and, and insect larvae and, and things like that. But we don't see the birds that we're keeping um, hunting and eating other birds and mammals. That typically isn't happening, you know, in general. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, I guess it's being able to draw a line, you know, when you bring a bird home and it, it, it's with any animal, actually, you know, you bring a puppy home. Yeah. You're going to want to spoil it and do this and do that, you know, but <laughs> as Tiffany has her dog up, right up there. <laughs> no, but, but when it comes to just, when it comes to just when we're talking about food in general, you know, Oh, I'll just give them my leftovers or something, you know, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I'll be honest. You know, a lot, I, I know a lot of people are guilty of these things. Um, but you know, when, especially when we're looking at health issues and all that, you know, you're going to have to go back to the drawing board and basically think about everything that you've done, um, or that you are doing, you know, um, that could be contributing to a health problem, um, you know, a plucking something, you know? Yeah. So. And so many of those issues are multifactorial, right? They, they could be a combination of things. Um, and I always say keeping birds is a scientific experiment that never ends. It, it, we're always trying to examine variables, things that happen in the environment that we're not picking up on. Um, we all know that birds can die from Teflon fumes, right? Like we, we know that's true, even though they don't appear to affect us, right? But we know that that's 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 there, um, right? Or oven cleaners, you know, things like that. But mm -hmm. we don't. We, we often need, yeah, yeah. I mean, all these different things that we're just um, we we can't see with the naked eye makes um, makes them vulnerable. But it, it's it makes us vulnerable because we don't know mm -hmm. to what degree these things are happening and how they're going to affect a bird that has different different physiology from us. Um, right. So it's it's a challenge. It's always going to be a challenge. <laughs> well, and we're always going to be learning something new, you know, mm -hmm. um, but that's the only way we, you know, find out about these things is because it happens to us. You know, I, well, you mentioned Teflon. I'm guilty that happened to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, I lost two birds and I had other ones that were, you know, on the brink of croaking. But luckily, I, I saved them. And it was just a mistake that I made. And I did not think of it. And this stuff does happen, you know, but it's up to, it's our experiences that allow us to get this information out there to hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, prevent something like that from happening to someone else. Right. Yeah. I mean, none of us are, are perfect. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I give my, I give my birds little pieces of pizza and now every time I do it, I think, <laughs> what would Jason do? <laughs> <laughs> Shame. I picture Shame. him. I picture him judging me, and then I think, yeah, I'll, I'll just give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> but having, but knowing, knowing makes you know to know means that you're more apt to do better, 
-hmm. right? So right. that's that's part that's half the battle. People that are stubborn and and stuck in their ways and not willing to learn, that's that's where you start to see a lot of problems and ultimately the animals are the ones that suffer. Right. Um, and and I think that's where where you're talking about the beans and the, the cooked rice and stuff. I mean, 10 years ago, that's what you were told to do. You mm -hmm. make the beans and the rice and you cook them up and you cool them and then you throw everything in there. And, you know, it's, but now it's changed. Now we have different information. So mm -hmm. you have to just keep being open to that, I guess. Yeah. Right, right. I'm going to buy I agree. those WWJD bracelets, but now it's what would Jason do? <laughs> 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 make sure to make sure to post a picture next time when you're feeding pizza in the avian raw <laughs> uh, whole food group <laughs> yeah like jason's gonna let that go in the group uh -huh. no he, he should just for shits and giggles <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh but yeah i mean lots of myths and i know i know jordan can speak to this specifically because since so I, I bred many species of lorries many years ago. Um, I actually started in, in college when I uh, first got some lorries. And back then you could get them pretty easily, but we had, we didn't have a lot of diets. We didn't have a lot of mm -hmm. understanding. And I remember, I remember raising a, a red lorry um, and <laughs> it, the breeder gave me um, monkey biscuits, peanut butter, apples and honey and you put them in a blender and that was basically <laughs> what it ate and some some uh, vitamins some powdered vitamins sometimes um mm -hmm. i mean that was all that was all we had and now um fully understanding like uh there's a ton of fruit that you can feed them actually because they actually like fruit and other things but jordan i mean what what you what has been your experience because you breed so many different types and you've seen so many mistakes made with these birds. Um, well, I learned. Be I learned because I learned from you know someone out of others who were breeding and raising them as well. When I bought my first pair of uh, rainbow lorikeets um, nine years ago or so, um, I bought a bag of pellets that said lori specific. Yeah. Brought brought them home. I fed them apples. Um, I think I fed th fed them something else. Um, I can't remember, but. They ate the apple, but didn't touch the pellets. So I'm sitting here and I'm in the, in the guy that I won't disclose the name, but the guy that sold them to me, um, didn't really, you know, tell me what I should be feeding them. So they didn't touch the pellets at all. And I was getting worried because I didn't necessarily know what to feed them. So I'm trying to look up nectar and I thought, oh, hummingbird nectar, I'll feed them hummingbird nectar. So I did buy hummingbird nectar <laughs> and they, you know, they didn't touch that either. And, you know, there is this huge myth that, oh, they can, they can have pellets, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, but, you know, in reality, it's not, it's not good for them because their tongues are specifically made to do something, uh, to do something. And that's to lap up the nectar um, and the pollen, you know, like they do in the wild. They have, uh, these brush tongues that you know collect the collect the the contents basically with pellets they can chew them you know and do all that but they can they basically would take them to the water and dunk them soften them up and then eat them so it's not like and I know a lot of other you know parrot species do do that too they'll they'll soften things up you know even with pellets so. Um, that was my basically first experience. And as I got, you know, to uh, get to know people in, in aviculture and especially in the lorry community, I, you know, learned how to feed them. I don't feed dry powder at all, other than mixing it with fruit or something. But that the dry powder is another easy way out for lorries. And people like to solidify their droppings because they do have projectile droppings. So they, they go to the dry powder to, to, I guess, you know, thicken it up, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, you're really compacting their, <laughs> compacting their, their intestines and they cannot flush those contents out, you know, the way they, that they should. They have a short digestive tract. They do it in the wild. Why do you want to stop that from happening? 
if if you cannot deal with the mess, then just do not get a lorry. Period. You know, they are not, in my opinion, they're not inside birds. If if you're going to have a pet, I would I always tell uh, customers make something that you can have outside, and then you know have a cage for inside. And you know when when the weather's right or something like that, you can put the bird outside, let it enjoy the sun and and all that. But you know, I feed um, nectar daily. I do fruits maybe three times a week. Fruit is expensive. So, um, I always, you know, tell people they don't have to feed fruit every day. And not only that, you're kind of overloading them, you know, when you're feeding you, when you serve nectar and then you have a bowl of fruits too, they will, they will not finish all of it. So you really, you're just burning money at that point, you know? So, um, so yeah, like I said, I, it's going to be 10 years this year. So it, t- it took a lot of learning and, um, there's things that I've said and mistakes that I've made and, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a learning process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And lorries, I mean, you, you, you talked about pellets with lorries. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not a fan of pellets for any birds, um, mm-hmm. outside of, you know, uh, tops pellets, which are cold pressed. Um, but those ultra processed pellets, I'm, I'm not a fan of. They have inflammatory compounds that just can lead to all kinds of things like we talked about earlier. But um, being able to offer different things so that you're covering your bases is is so important. So even if you're giving your birds fresh food three times a week, that's that's mm-hmm. they're still getting their nutrients, right? Birds don't get 100% of their nutrients every day. There, that is, right. there's no such thing as that when it comes to parrots, right? They may get vitamin A on a Monday and then that vitamin A carries them through for, for the week, you know, but um, that, that notion that they have to have a hundred percent of their nutrients in a 24 hour period is false. That's, that's not how it works for us. It's not how it works for, for most, most animals. Or even that right. they have that nutrition available for 24 mm-hmm. seven, uh, you know, that they're, has to be food available in the cage 24-7. They need a quality seed mix 24-7. I hear this all the time with parrotlets, and it drives me crazy because anyone who owns, if you have birds like me, where for the most part, you know, my my birds are breeders, so they're, um, you know, they're not living life with me and my, as a family with me, um, they're not eating when it's dark outside. So it doesn't make any sense for them to have a, a high quality seed blend and what does high quality mean um 24 hours a day because then those same people are the people that are coming and saying i'm having a hard time transitioning my bird to fresh food because it won't eat it and then you you find out well that's because they have mcdonald's available to them 24 7 so why would they want to eat this when they have this right comfortable i'm familiar with this i know what this is i know what this tastes like i know what i like and then i've got it available to me 24 7 so i can also pick out my favorites and i know that you're going to dump more in it at the end of the day right right yeah in, in in the wild birds are migrating looking for food you know they don't have it right there in front of them either and when they do eat it's they tend to gorge themselves first thing in the morning and then throughout the day they will pick at things you know so with my diet here, I add things to the nectar so they can, you know, pick at it throughout the day. And I do only feed them what I know they'll finish in like four to six hours. Um, people leaving dry powder and nectar overnight in cages for lorries has been a, I've, I've heard of that being a problem. I've had people come forward and, and tell me that that's what they're doing. And that's not a good idea because it the nectar dry powder what have you not contains sugar sugar spoils um so you have that problem and that that could easily give your bird a fungal or bacterial infection not only that you're going to attract if your birds are outside you're going to be attracting insects and rodents um those insects and rodents are going to defecate in the food bowls um urinate in the food bowls thus leaving bacteria uh, bacteria or parasites behind and the next thing you know, you're taking your bird to the vet or the bird, you know, passes away because of that. So I never, I never um, leave food overnight. I don't top off food, nothing like that. Yeah. And it's uh, people, I hear this is another myth. 
that they can't, they've been told they can't leave fresh food in the cage in the morning more than a couple of hours because it's going to spoil. Mm -hmm. That is a complete myth. Fresh food does not spoil within a day. You could leave a salad out. You're not going to come home from work that day and it's going to be moldy. Like that doesn't happen, right? What that does happen with is cooked food. Cooked food spoils very quickly because you've basically broken it down through, with heat. And then that just makes molds, you know, other types of fungi, uh, bacteria go insane. And then you add sugar to the mix. Like Jordan just said, yeast loves sugar. And we all have yeast. Birds, we, also, we, we all have yeast in our bodies. And we want to make sure that we're, we've, we're keeping it at a, a, a normal level and not go insane. And by giving them all that sugar, you know, that can happen. Um, and the sugar, especially in refined carbohydrates, which you would find in processed pellets, that's a huge problem with yeast um, and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, wet pellets, bad idea, right? Just really bad idea. But fresh food is not going to go bad while you're at work. It's It'll be fine. And um, I follow the same rule as Jordan does, they typically finish their food within hours so that the bowls are empty by the end of the day, um, or at least close to being empty, which means they mm -hmm. ate what they were supposed to within the time frame they were supposed to. Right. Lisa? <laughs> yeah, I, f I feed my birds in the morning and I pick it up at night. And that's when I do the waters. I I wash the water bowls and replace them. I throw the food bowls in the dishwasher and then I, you know, fill them up the next day. And granted, it's Colorado and it's super dry here. So you just end up with dehydrated food at the end of the day. But um, I probably wouldn't do that with cooked food. And honestly, Jordan, I'm glad you said that about the powder because I didn't even think about that. I figured, oh, oh the powder's okay. good. Yeah. Powder's good in the bowl. I'll just <laughs> replace it, you know, when it's gone. I'll I'll fill it right. up. And you said that um, a while back when we were all chatting, and I thought, oh my god, I got to pick yeah. that up at night too. Yeah, yeah, because they do go to the water, the water bowl, and then they they run back and forth between the two. Mm -hmm. So they're putting their mouth and their tongue on everything. So mm -hmm. it 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 does bacteria does spread that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I think it's a really good idea to to um, touch up on this again. You know, I've seen people not just pertaining to Lori's, but they have, you know, a food bowl and it's filled to the rim with food and they're just leaving it in there all day. You know, as T as Tiffany mentioned, you know, when that's available 24 seven, you're just wasting food at that point, you know, mm -hmm. and you're not you're not really allowing your bird the. um the choice of diversity, I guess, you know, when it comes to feeding different things. So, yeah. Well, in portion sizes, and Tiffany and I just talked about this recently, very recently. Um, and when people see what I recommend as portion sizes, they, they lose it. They get, sometimes they get <laughs> mad at me and I'm like, yeah. I'm just, I'm not trying to starve your bird. I'm trying to be realistic. If you've got a if you've got a parrotlet, it doesn't need like twenty four ounces of food in its cage. Like it can't possibly. Right. It doesn't even weigh that much. Like so. <laughs> so you know, I, with with small birds, I do a heaping tablespoon of fresh food in the morning and a heaping tablespoon of dry food in the evening. Um, medium birds two and two, large birds three and three. Um, and then if they're eating all of that food very, very quickly, you know, you've covered all your, your nutritional bases. They've eaten all those different things. And then you can add a little bit more if you want, like adding more sprouts mm -hmm. isn't going to do any damage, right? Those, those can only be, you know, good for them. But when it comes to, um, you know, feeding seed or fruit or whatever it may be, people tend like I've seen foraging plates which are a literal plate <laughs> with like half a squash on it filled with just food all over the place and that you're, you're wasting a ton of money <laughs> say it again I've literally seen you share like a half of an acorn squash <laughs> yeah, well, for, for, like half a pumpkin with a couple tablespoons of sprouts in there like that's foraging they're not going to eat that whole pumpkin right but to right. 
to give them a whole plate that is like a human plate with full and overflowing. That's just, that's just a bad idea. I was on, I was right. at a conference and I was on a panel discussion with four vets, two conservationists and me. And um, someone had asked the question about offering fresh foods and that making birds hormonal. And the vets tended to agree with that. And I disagreed. I don't have any hormonal birds. I feed fresh food every single day. The problem is that if you're not consistent, you're going to have those problems. So if you're, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, if, if you, if you wait a week because you just don't have time to feed sprouts or veg or whatever it is, um, and then you're going to treat your bird on Sunday when you have time, you just like gave it this blast of, oh, look at all this nutrition. So fresh food doesn't make your birds hormonal. Changes in diet, sudden changes in diets mm -hmm. can make the birds hormonal. And that's, that's where the, the issues I think sometimes come. So, you know, offering them fresh food every single day is so critical. Um, and you got to do it right. in the morning when, when they are hungry, the hungriest, um, and not leave food in there the night before so that they can, you know, eat the lesser quality food and ignore the higher quality food. Yeah. And in the wild, when birds are breeding and they're feeding youngsters, there's usually an abundance of food are, you know, available for them to feed their young and make sure that they stay healthy at the same time. So that goes back, to, you know, to what you said about um, changing the all of a sudden making changes. Yeah, if that's fine if you have breeding birds, but if you're if you have the one pet cockatoo, um, and you know, and you're you're doing that, you're gonna have you're gonna have hormonal problems. Yep. So. It's so Yes, it's so I overfeed my birds. I feel like everybody's looking at me. Here's your talk. <laughs> it is you know you you, you know you give curve. them a slice of pizza every day, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. I won't bring up the ice cream. <laughs> um oh, Lord. but yeah, and and just uh, you know to to kind of end um those unrealistic expectations we have for keeping a bird, you know, mm -hmm. you've heard us say many times, they're not little people. Um, and that doesn't denigrate the bird. It, it, we should be respecting birds for being birds. And yes. um, this, you know, we, we have these, I, I see a lot of unrealistic expectations like, oh, well, if I get this bird, I'm sure it'll be quiet for me, or I'm sure it won't ever bite, or I'm sure it'll eat exactly what I want it to. Um, <laughs> none of that's true. Yeah. Or, or I can put silly costumes on it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. I, I, I agree with that 100%. Jordan's going to get hate mail over that one. <laughs> Come at me. Yeah. <laughs> Only from the moon. So our audio is taking a while to reach him. Oh, Okay. <laughs> I was wondering what the delay was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought you guys. I thought you guys were all like, "Oh no." <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty anti dressing up birds. Um, that's uh, that's definitely not something I would recommend. Um, but I, you know, I think once again, it gets to that anthropomorphizing and treating them like little people, which does the bird a disservice. It sets up unrealistic ex expectations, and then you start to see behavioral issues as a result of those things, especially hormonal, you know, where people want to touch their birds all over their body. Um, they want to feed them certain things because they think it's cute. Those are, you know, all those things I see leading or letting them crawl inside their shirts, um, you know, things like that, All they all lead to these, um, to really horrible things. And we want to keep, we want to keep birds in people's homes. Uh, we don't want them being surrendered because they don't understand them or don't respect them for what they actually are. Right. Yep. Absolutely. The number of times I've seen people share a video of their parrotlet, um, and they say, what is he doing? And they have this bird on on their hand and it's very clear to those of us who know birds what this bird is doing to their hand and then they understand why should i not let him do this 
And, you know, you have to kind of explain, well, obviously they're treating you in a way and then they're going to get frustrated. And, you know, that's when you start to see that aggression and, um, you know, that they'll start lashing out and don't encourage it. So if it's happening, you know, you need to figure out a way to make it stop, whether that's putting them on a play stand or redirecting the behavior or doing something right. like fighting and all this stuff that, you know, they just assume it's like what you said earlier, you take home this baby that really for all intents and purposes doesn't have a personality yet. And, and then you get disappointed or you get upset when it goes from being this quiet, you know, sort of sleepy, mild mannered bird to having the personality, which is what you would think that you would want it for in the first place. And then it's too much, you know, <laughs> fighting, there's too much noise, there's too much dander, there's too much mess. Mm -hmm. right. There are people thinking that they can bond with um, a baby bird by hand rearing oh, yeah. it. You know, like we, we hear a lot of that, right? Um, and I often, that, that that takes some education because you, it it's it sort of seems like common sense, but it actually isn't. I mean, when you think common sense, birds don't bond with a mate or another bird or establish a family group or anything like that until way after weaning. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's right, right. that's definitely something that um, a myth that's that's uh, keeps getting perpetuated out there. Right. And even even when people have an existing bird in the home and they bring home a new bird and it's a baby and their existing bird is already mature and they put the bird in, the birds in the same cage yeah. and all that, you're going to have problems. I actually saw somebody post something like that the other day um, and they were concerned because their existing bird was trying to regurgitate food to the to the. Uh, youngster and the youngster was a was a female the existing bird is a male so he was obviously excited and happy and that's what they do to try to bond and pair up but you know that you're you're gonna just be set up for disaster and not only that that baby needs a chance to get comfortable in its own space before it's mm -hmm. even put in a situation like that so you know it, it's um a lot of people just don't think about these things, and and then next thing you know, they're they're either rehoming one or or something because they don't know what to do. Well, a lot of the problem comes back to the owner for not understanding those. Yeah, and and a lot of it is we reinforce behaviors, and we don't know that we're reinforcing behaviors. Um, right. You know, with the, with the screaming, for example, which is a huge <laughs> problem for people. And I, and I get it. I, I, I totally get it. Um, what's the first thing most people do when the bird screams? They give them attention, right? They look in their direction. They move to the cage. They do whatever. That is reinforcing the behavior because the bird is screaming and you're mm -hmm. giving it attention. Even just looking in its direction is a reinforcer. And, and especially so, yelling, shut up. Because yes. <laughs> stop the bird from screaming, that just yep. teaches the bird to yell, shut up. Yep. The, and you're giving yeah, them attention. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And like, I was talking to a, a, an ex coworker of mine the other day, and um, she was asking me, she, was, she said to me, which is something that we all see all the time, I know we do, and I know it drives us crazy, is that her biggest her biggest interest point in getting a bird is she wants something that's going to talk. And I told her, well, number one, even with a species that's very well known for their talking capabilities, it's never a guarantee. And number two, sure, it seems cute when you see an Indian ringneck saying, what are you doing in a 20 second TikTok? But then when you're at home with it and it's saying, what are you doing for eight hours straight? <laughs> it's a complete <laughs> story. Right. Anything. Yeah. Right. Now that happens right. with African greys a lot. People get them, and probably 50% of the time when you see one come into a rescue, if it's not due to somebody dying or, you know, something like that, it's going to be because that bird has picked up a really annoying noise. Well, it only does yeah. the smoke detector sound, and it does it over <laughs> and over yeah. all the time. And, you know, I wanted a bird that talked. Well, 
African greys, from what I've seen, will pick up a noise before they'll pick up speech almost yep. every time. Yep. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If, you're, if your sole intent is to get a bird because they can talk, go to, I would, I would just get a stuffed animal or, or a, a toy at that point, you know, because yeah. ex ex yeah. exactly, you know, do not get a bird if that's what you want them for. And I get a lot of that, a lot of those questions all the time, you know, do you have anything that will talk? And I'll just send them a picture of a stuffed animal, you know, <laughs> a toddler. <It's, laughs> yeah. You, it's in, in, I, I'm not intentionally trying to be, you know, trying to be mean or anything like that, but that's just the cold, hard truth. And a lot of the time, that's what we need. We need the cold, hard truth. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's important because it'll be the bird that'll end up suffering in the end. If they, mm -hmm. you know, they'll get dumped at a rescue or they'll go through a bunch of homes because people don't like their normal vocalizing or because right. they picked up some annoying sound. I mean, that's right. They there aren't that many Patagonian Conyers around anymore, but um, there when there were some around, I mean, you'd see them come into rescues for that because they're so mm -hmm. loud. But yeah, they're super friendly, but they're really, really loud. Right. Yeah. And they're partially nocturnal, so <laughs> they do that stuff at night. Yeah. <laughs> So they do need yeah. food. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so this was fun. Uh, you know, and we do want to say we're not here to shame you. We're not here to make you feel bad about, you know, if any of these things are going on in your homes. We're just here to educate and help support you because we want birds to stay in their homes. So um, if you have uh, questions, you can reach out to us. Um, and, uh, we'll, uh, see you next time, I guess, for the next, uh, next episode. So thank you everybody for, for, uh, listening as long as you have, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> All right, bye guys. Alrighty. Bye. Bye.